So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful, Lord, for this morning and uh, for all those that are participating in this study here and for the light that you have given us over the past several months um, to help to understand our disappointment. And Lord, um, as we look back at the beginning of this message, um, especially in regards to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, we ask, Lord, for your spirit that gave this light uh, to shine upon our hearts and our minds and to help us to understand the things that we are studying. Be with each person. Help us in our personal devotion and study and in the trials of this life. Be with us now, we pray, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So this is the last article from the 1996 uh, series that Jeff did in our Firm Foundation magazine. And um, we're going to take today and tomorrow to, to complete this. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a review tomorrow and probably a little bit today as well. So this is the final verse, verse 45. Um, and somebody mentioned it's the 156th anniversary of Lincoln's shooting. So I'm not sure what the rest of that says. Ha Zakadon in Israel. Secular Israel's Remembrance Day. Okay, interesting. So, um, so we're studying this verse forty-five. Now we're going to go through. I'm going to draw these things out again, uh, what we had done earlier, and try to complete this line. Um, so we're just going to start reading this verse here. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. And he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Daniel 11, verse 45. This verse describes where the king of the north comes to his end. The King James Version implies that the papacy is in the glorious holy mountain. And several other translations indicate that the verse might be better translated to indicate that the papacy places his tabernacle, uh, his uh, palatial tabernacles or war tents between the seas and the holy mountain. Um, so they're gonna give an amplified version, which says, and he shall pitch his palatial tents between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, Zion, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. Daniel 11, verse 45, amplified version. Now, uh, this verse, I'm just gonna look at it in, uh, I'll show you, I won't use eSword. I'm going to use my Scholar's Gateway here to show you this. So I'm going to share this. Uh, so Scholar's Gateway, it, you, you can see this is uh, Hebrew. Uh, the nice thing about it is I can just hold my cursor over top of Word, and it'll give me uh, like this first word here. Um, uh, Vayita. It just, it says it's a verb. It's the, the kal imperfect. So that has to do with uh, the form of the verb. So third person masculine singular and so forth. So it's kind of a helpful tool. Uh, scholarsgateway.com for anybody who wants to go a little bit deeper into the Hebrew. And Greek, it's it's a very useful tool. Now, where we're going to uh, deal with is this part here, and it it says vaba, so that's ba is just uh, to, to go in, right? And in uh, let me see here. So you got um, har and uh, tisbi. That's the, the glorious and holy Kadesh is, is holy mountain. So this is the word here, uh, the 
holiest, the, um, uh, the glorious holy mountain. Now, the letter here right in front of it is called Alamed. And Alamed, it's, it's um, basically a preposition. So, so just like to or against or from, those types of things. And in this case, it generally means to. So literally, it would be, and over here we have the word between, uh, bien, and then the seas, yamim. So you got between the seas, and then it has this word to the glorious holy mountain. Now, if it was between the seas in, you would actually have a different, um, you would have a bet in front of this. You wouldn't have a lament. So the King James translates it incorrectly. And so I'm just going to go back to uh, the Bible. I'll go to the Bible, not back to, because we were looking at that. Um, so go to the text itself. So when he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, it would only be in if you had a bet, the letter B, in front of that phrase. And we don't. We have a lament. Now, um, if you compare these different translations, so he, he showed us one translation, uh, you're going to see quite a bit of difference. Now, one is up here you have a translation of the Greek. Septuagint, where it says between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Um, so again, they have that word in. Uh, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. That's the King James uh, bishops in the glorious holy mountain again. Um, between the seas. In, so a lot of the translations say in, even though that's not what the Hebrew says. And, and I'm not really sure why. So uh, whether it's an interpretive translation that they think they understand what it's talking about, or whether um, it's just, you know, they're trying to make sense out of it in English. So you're going to see some that say uh, between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, but again, it's not even and, uh, because if it was and, you would have a va uh, before that that phrase. So, so you're in, in toward the holy mountain? Well, it actually means against. So when you have something that's to, to the glorious holy mountain, it can mean against it. So if we go back to, to here, the way that I would translate this, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace uh, between the seas against the glorious holy mountain. Or up against, right? To it would be just a literal translation to the glorious holy mountain, but it's not yeah, for, for Lord. What's that? Um, I've always heard that uh, the King James was based on the Greek, not the Hebrew. Mm, no, King James is based on the Hebrew. Interesting. It's, it's um, one of the first major translations that's translated from the Hebrew rather than the Greek. Right, so early translations uh, were translated from the Greek, you know, into English, like uh, Tyndale's uh, translation and, or so William Tyndale, I think that's who it is. Anyway, so some of the early translations were translated from the Greek, but the King James was translated from the original language, Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament, so. So I'm not sure where you heard that, how you got that impression. So anyway, this is between the seas against or to the glorious holy mountain, which gives a different impression. And I think part of the reasons they might have translated it this way is it just doesn't, it just doesn't flow well in English. Um, because you wouldn't normally say things that way in English. And so when we talk about between the seas, we're gonna to have to figure out what this 
would mean. So we're, we're going to look at, at this uh, passage and how Jeff interprets it. So we're going to go back there. But I just wanted to point that out about, about the Hebrew, what it, what it actually says. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, so he has another one uh, translation, the New King James. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. And um, the glorious holy mountain is God's church, according to the following verses. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established upon the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall float unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the house of, of let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2, 2 to 3. The seas are the people of the world, and he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse is, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Revelation 17, verse 5. One of the questions most often raised about Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, is whether or not the glorious holy mountain of verse 45 is the same as the glorious land of verse 41. So this, this is obviously something where people just superficially look at it. And they see the same words and glorious land, glorious holy mountain, and they just equate them as being the same thing. So he's going to show that they're not. Both symbols contain the adjective translated as glorious, but if we drop the word glorious from both phrases, we see a distinction made between a land and a mountain. The land of verse 41 is where God's people and truth were placed in order to facilitate the proclamation of the final message of warning. Uh, the church, which was raised up to proclaim the message, is the holy mountain of verse 45. Both are glorious in their own way, but a church and a country where the church was raised up are two different entities, though they are closely related. This verse describes when humanity will finally be divided into two groups. The papacy is portrayed as being in the middle ground between these two groups of people. For the papacy as being the primary object used by Satan to prevent the people of the world from hearing the last message of warning. With the papacy's position in the middle, the people who reject the last message of warning are on one side, while God's people stand on the other. There are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law and those who keep his law. Two great opposing powers are revealed in the great battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his commands. On the other side stands the prince of darkness, with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. Daniel 11.45 describes the dividing line for humanity illustrated by the palatial tents of the man of sin. On one side are those who reflect the man of sin's character of self-exaltation, while on the other side, we see those who reflect the self-sacrificing love of Jesus, their king. In this verse, the fundamental principle of the mystery of iniquity, self-exaltation, is symbolized by the king of the north defiantly planting his palatial war tents in full view of the universe and proclaiming himself king of those represented by the seas while also preparing to destroy those who make up the glorious holy mountain. At, at the height of this arrogant act, the king of the north comes to his end, and none shall help him. So there's a number of things here, I guess, that we could reflect upon. When we think about, when we think about this geographically, uh, to Daniel writing this, when he talks about uh, between the seas and the glorious, 
up against the glorious holy mountain. Now, why is he using seas? Because uh, he's using yamin, right? So he's, he's referring to seas in the plural. Because wouldn't we, we recognize if we were looking at the land of Israel, wouldn't there be the sea? The Mediterranean be referred to as the sea. So what is the seas? I, I don't know if you understand what I'm asking. He, he's going to answer this later on, but. Well, we've got the idea of seas as people anyway. Yeah, so, so we're using them as people, but we just go back to the time of Daniel. So when you talk about between the seas, what seas would those be? He, he's going to talk about it later in the article, but I want you to think about it now. Between the Dead Sea and the um, Mediterranean. Okay, so between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And, and I think this is an important point, that when we're looking at, at Daniel, and, and he's, he has this, this representation of what he's seen, he's seen things that exist in his day. So we know that seas represent people. But he's not seeing people, he's seeing seas. And now how does this relate to the understanding of how we interpret the book of Daniel regarding literal and figurative? Well, then Daniel would be undoubtedly thinking of Jerusalem. So we need to understand what he means spiritually by Jerusalem. Right. So he's giving us a representation. And many people will look at this and they will look at it as the battle of Armageddon in the land of Israel. Right. So they will say, well, the seas are the Mediterranean and the, and the Dead Sea. Um, so, so you'd look at Armageddon. So you'd look at the Valley of Megiddo. He's going to talk about this later in the article, but um, but they would look at this as some kind of literal battle because they would say, well, these seas are these places. And, and I think that could be part of the reason why they translate it the way that they do, because they're seeing that this is the glorious holy mountain is Mount Zion, and it's between uh, the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. And, and it's in this, this area of Megiddo, which is near, um, you know, it's, it's, it's in that area. And that's how they're interpreting. Now, one of the things about the word Armageddon, what does the word Armageddon mean? I mean, they're not bringing it up here. He's going to bring it up later, but. The Why? mountain of Megiddo. Yeah, the mountain of Megiddo, where Megiddo is actually a valley or a plain, right? It's not a mountain. Um, so, so Armageddon, when, it, when we use the word Armageddon, which comes from Revelation, I think it's actually a symbol because what does a mountain symbolize? A church or a legal system. A church or a legal system? Okay. A government. Okay, a government. Yeah, I would think it, it refers to a kingdom. Um, so yeah, I guess a government with the legal system. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go on and read read here. Um, Daniel eleven forty five describes the dividing line for humanity, illustrated by the racial tense of the man of sin. One side are those who reflect the man's character. I think I read that. Um, yeah, okay, so in the Hebrew lexicon found in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, we find the following definitions, which may help us to understand some of the key words of verse 45. Uh, so the word plant, it's a primitive root properly to strike in, to fix, um, specifically to plant, literally or figuratively, to fasten, plant. So, uh, so this is to, to establish something like planting a plant. You would plant a plant by putting it in the ground. You're going to fix it into place. 
uh, tabernacles uh, a tent as clearly conspicuous from a distance. Covering, dwelling, place, home, tabernacle, tent. Um, now it says it comes, the primitive root is to be clear, to shine. Um, and that's because having to do with being conspicuous from a distance. So a tent is something that can be seen or to be clear, right? So that's the relationship. So he's going to use these words in his interpretation. And a palace, apparently a foreign der derivation, a pavilion or palace tent, palace. So the action of placing oneself between a message of God and its intended recipients is used in verse 45 and is also a common illustration in the spirit of prophecy. Um, the action of placing, uh, let me see, oh, here it is. Uh, Though being unable to expel God from his throne, Satan has charged God with satanic attributes and has claimed the attributes of God as his own. He is a deceiver. And through his serpentine sharpness, through his crooked practices, he has drawn to himself the homage which man should have given to God and has placed his satanic throne between the human worshiper and the divine father. Um, just prior to the coming of the Son of Man, there is, and has been for years, a determination on the part of the enemy to cast his hellish shadow right between mm -hmm. man and his Savior. What's that? Did you say something, Pat? I said planted instead of placed. You've gone past it. It's no big deal. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, I don't see that, but anyway. Uh, he, the great teacher, was in the world. He was the light of the world. But Satan interposed his hellish shadow between him and the souls whom Christ came to save. So this interposition of, of, of Satan's hellish doctrines, his, his hellish shadow, um, his throne, so to speak, in between the light that God has given and um, and the people, right? We entreat of you who oppose the light of truth to stand out of the way of God's people. Let heaven sent light shine forth upon them in clear and steady rays. So these different statements, manuscript releases, uh, volume six, volume seven, signs of the times, March 20th, 1901, and this one, Review and Herald, May 27th, 1890. The next one's Councils and writer, to Writers and Editors, page 38. Let no one run the risk of interposing himself between the people and the message of heaven. The message of God will come to the people. And if there were no voice among men to give it, the very stones would cry out. Um, the Sabbath is the Lord's test, and no man, be he king, priest, or ruler, is authorized to come between God and man. Testimonies 9, uh, 234. In the previous article, we discussed Daniel 11, verse 44, and the reaction of the king of the north to the message of Christ's righteousness, as symbolized by the tidings which come from the east and the north. That verse identified the fear and anger of the northern king as he recognized the loud cry message. As he launches forth to destroy and make away many, Probation closes and the world has been divided into two classes. Verse 45 continues the description by, by portraying this division, but it also, it, it also uses prophetic symbols which point to Armageddon, described in Revelation 16. East of the Mediterranean Sea, southwest of the Sea of Galilee, and north of the Dead Sea is Megiddo. About 35 miles south of Megiddo is Jerusalem, while just about 10 miles northwest is Megiddo. We find, or of Megiddo, we find Mount Carmel. Between Megiddo and Jerusalem is Mount Gerizim and Ebal, and the mountains of cursing, the mountains of cursing and blessing. In this geographical setting, we see the final end of the papacy set forth symbolically in Daniel 11, verse 45. 
The biblical history of these locations is abundant with information, symbolically pointing to the battle which ends with the second coming of Christ. Most Bible commentators locate the king of the north in Daniel 11.45 in the very middle of this Old Testament geography. This geographic symbolism is, of course, identifying the battle of Armageddon found in Revelation 16. We must be consistent with our application of prophetic rules, and although the allusion to Megiddo is easily seen in Daniel 11.45, we must continue to seek to find the spiritual location of this verse, not the literal. And that was the problem, of course, with Josiah Lich's interpretation, in that uh, they were looking at this as battles between um, France and um, Turkey and Syria and Egypt. And, and that sort of has continued within Christianity. So we know that the, uh, uh, Angela points us to the mountains of blessing and cursing is the 2520, Leviticus 26. Um, so we, we have this um, people interpreting the battle of Armageddon as something that happens in Israel. And if we were going to use these arguments that this is Turkey or Syria and, uh, and, and literally Egypt, what would be the problem in trying to understand verse 45? What would we have to conclude? I once read the area of the Valley of Megiddo is so small, a supersonic jet can't even turn around and so it'll be hard to crowd all the armies of the world into there. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a small area. Um, but what would be the problem prophetically? Now, I remember when I first became an Adventist, um, I, I was really... Uh, they do. Yeah, Mark. Um, <laughs> people here's a um why I put this right Lord give uh, yes Lord give as his son mm -hmm. he wear a different clothes on people don't know he is he walk away more people not know where, where people don't uh, uh, his own people don't know he is where he came from. They don't know he is. Okay, so how does this relate to the Battle of Armageddon? Um, he, the Lord said to him, he wearing a uh, different clothes they don't know he is okay I'm not sure i understand how that relates to the battle of armageddon there must but, be some um, connection you know, uh, 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 before that before that so christ takes takes off his priestly garments and put on his garments of vengeance is that what you're talking about yes okay Okay, thanks. Now, um, so we know that many people look at this battle of Armageddon as a literal battle. So I was talking about when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, um, I was looking at my grandmother's library and I noticed that she had this book. Um, I'm trying to think of the title, but it was written in the 1920s. It was an Adventist book. Um, on prophecy, so I, like something about end time prophecy, but I, it was a Cole Porter book, 
So I, I don't know how she ended up with it because uh, she was always opposed to Adventists because she used to know some Seventh-day Adventists. And um, so anyway, uh, our, I think it was our day in the light of prophecy or something like that. Um, anyway, the position that they took is that the Battle of Armageddon was a literal battle in Jerusalem. And back at that time, I didn't know much about, you know, the issues, but I just, it didn't strike me as being correct as I read through it. And it was dealing actually with Uriah Smith's interpretation of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. And it was taking uh, that position that we would see here, that this is literal, the planting of his tabernacle between the sea, seas and the glorious holy mountain would be a battle in in the land of israel so so this idea existed within adventism for a long time as a predominant idea so we were promoting a literal battle of armageddon uh, but the battle of armageddon we understand to be a spiritual battle not a literal battle uh, but that hasn't always been agreed upon within adventism especially um, after the death of ellen white uh, you see that this literal battle idea popping up, and partly from Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and Revelation. Um, so we're going to be looking for a spiritual location, not a literal location. And that's that's actually a really important point that he's making out, um, that I don't think he understands everything about that uh, that statement. Because what is a location? What do we mean by a spiritual location? Well, we think of a, a literal place, a position on the, you know, on the surface of the earth somewhere. Yeah. So what's a spiritual location? Yeah, that could be anywhere or everywhere. Yeah. So now one of the things it would be a point in time, but also a condition, a situation that has arisen. So the location of the Battle of Armageddon is not really a place. It's not, a, it's not about the geography of it. It's about where we are in history, locating it in history or locating it in time. What are the situ what's the situation that has to arise to see the Battle of Armageddon and what it's about? Uh, it was quite an eye-opener to me to see Jeff point to Revelation 10, isn't it? Where the angel uh, has one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, and the beachhead is, is located between 1798 and 1989. Yeah. That... Yeah, it's Revelation 10. So in Catholicism, Protestantism, and even in Adventism today, we find men interpreting this verse as literal Israel. The geographical and historical information contained within this verse is describing where the entire world is spiritually located when the Battle of Armageddon gets underway. To identify the glorious holy mountain as literal modern Jerusalem would be cons inconsistent with the previous five verses, for they have all been understood in their modern spiritual setting. If one chooses to identify the glorious holy mountain in this verse as the present day Jerusalem, then consistent, consistency and prophetic application demands that all the symbols in this sequence should have literal counterparts. This is not possible. For Edom of verse 41 no longer exists as a nation or a people. If we were to review this presentation of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, from the first article, which began in January 1996 until this final article, we would find that we have consistently applied the symbolic spiritual application of the figures and symbols in agreement with the understanding that these events occur after the cross. We also have seen that the sequence of conquests by the papacy as it returns to its former position of power is the same sequence set forth in the book of Revelation. We also identify this sequence as an accurate rep repetition of the history 
portrayed in Daniel 11, verse 30 to 35, which Sister White identified as a pattern by which to compare the final events recorded in Daniel 11. So he's just dealing with the, uh, the setting up of, of Rome and then the papacy, and then how that repeats in our history. While noting that the last scenes of prophecy would address the man of sin, we also identified that within the books of Daniel and Revelation, there would be an increase of knowledge, which would prepare God's people to stand in these last days. And that this increase of knowledge would include a knowledge about the man of sin. Not only did we establish some of the connections between these verses with the book of Revelation, but the prevailing theme of these verses can easily be verified by the events which are transpiring in the world today. We considered that our greatest need as God's people is for revival and reformation. And we noted that Sister White said this needed revival would come from an understanding found in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. We begin this study by comparing, we began this study by comparing the events set forth in the first chapter of Testimonies Volume 9 and found there that Sister White identified these final events uh, with the fulfillment of Daniel 11. So that was in just going back and remembering that. So volume nine, that is where we have 9-11 and um, described in, in that section that he's referring to is that section that begins in uh, Testimonies 9, page 11. More sobering though, is that as Sister White pointed to these final events of Daniel 11, she then stated that the final movements will be rapid ones. Brothers and sisters, the final rapid events portrayed in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, began to unfold seven years ago in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. It is high time that we awaken to the signs of the times. So this, this article is in November, of 96, so it's almost probably exactly seven years. I don't know exactly what date they published the issue, um, but it would be almost exactly seven years from the fall of, of the, the Berlin Wall. But there is a day that God hath appointed for the close of this world's history. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world, in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, Matthew 24, 14. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. More, much more should be said about these tremendously important subjects. The day is at hand when the destiny of every soul will be forever, fixed forever. The day of the Lord hastens on apace. The false watchmen are raising the cry, all is well. But the day of God is rapidly approaching. Its footsteps are so muffled that it does not arouse the world from the death-like slumber into which it has fallen. While the watchmen cry, peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them, and they shall not escape. First, Thess First Thessalonians 5, verse 3. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, Luke 21, 35. It overtakes the pleasure lover and the sinful man as a thief in the night. When all is apparently secure, Men ret retire contented uh, to contented rest. Um, and men retire to uh, contented rest. Then the prowling, stealthy midnight thief steals upon his prey. When it is too late to prevent the evil, it is discovered that some door or window is not secured. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 44. People are now settling to rest, imagining themselves secure um, under the popular churches. But let all beware, lest there is a place left open for the enemy to gain an entrance. Great pains should be taken to keep the subject before the people. The solemn fact is to be kept not only before the people of the world, but before our own churches that the day of the Lord will come, uh, that the day of the Lord will come suddenly, unexpectedly. Uh, so we need to know that, that these events 
back in 1996, and, and Jeff is, of course, quoting Spirit of Prophecy, we know that a lot of events have occurred since then. And who does it come unexpectedly to? Those that are not watching. Right. So those that are watching, it doesn't come suddenly and unexpectedly to. The fearful warning of the prophecy is addressed to every soul. Let no one feel that he is secure from the danger of being surprised. Let no one's interpretation of prophecy rob you of the conviction of the knowledge of events which show that his great event is near at hand, or this great event is near at hand. So what Jeff is, is focusing upon here as he closes this study is that we need to be watching, we need to be aware of those prophetic events, and we don't want to have an interpretation of prophecy that will rob us of the conviction of the knowledge of events. Uh, which show that the great event is near at hand. This great event is near at hand. So we have seen that happen within Adventism since 1996. I would think that most Adventists feel fairly secure in the world at the present time. They feel secure that the events of prophecy regarding the end of the world are far off. And now in our study, in this movement, we have done something that um, I think is prophetic. One is we have looked at the events as being near. Now we're gonna we're gonna go to the board and we're gonna draw this this on the board. Um, and and just a note here: these uh, prophetic studies. Uh, it unfortunately we can't order these anymore, uh, but these were presentations that were done several months, probably that summer. Um, and some of these would have been Jeff's presentations. I don't know if anybody has copies of these presentations from 1996. I don't know if Pat has some old videos. I have them on cassette tape. You have them on cassette tape? Well, that would be good. If you yeah. guys hear Jeff's presentation. Couldn't afford the videos. But you don't you don't need to see him, you just need to hear the messages. It'd be interesting to see what he has to say. You probably still have a cassette player too. Well, not the original one, just a cheapy one from Walmart. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I don't have a cassette player. Um so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna go to the whiteboard. And we're going to take a look at um at these things here. So. so we have uh, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Uh, the way that Jeff understands it in 1996. So you're going to have the time of the end and the time of the end in 1989. Um, and you're going to have the king of the north and the king of the south. And the king of the south is going to be um, there's going to be this battle. So the king of the north wins this battle against the king of the south. So the king of the north is victorious. And of course, this was just a response to 1798, which was also the time of the end. But in that one, the king, the king of the, I'm going to do that backwards, the king of the north. So that king of the south is victorious over the king of the north, right? So, so that's uh, verse 40 A, and this is 40 B.
So verse 41, what is verse 41? How's Jeff marking? What's, what's the events of verse 41? Eden, Moab, and Ammon. No. So. I've got to get my Bible out. Okay. Anybody? What happens in verse 41? The Sunday law in the United States. Okay, so it's the Sunday law in the United States. And uh, so what, what's happening here? So the king of the north here loses. So when the king of the south comes here in 1989, what is this, what would Jeff call this, this victory over the king of the south? Because you're going to have over here the glorious land. Uh, so you're going to have the king of the north is victorious over the glorious land. Because that's what it's going to talk about. So the glorious land. So this is going to be the Sunday law in the U.S. So what would we call these? What's the king of the south? What's the glorious land? Geographical areas. Okay, geographical areas or obstacles, right? So these are the obstacles. So this is the first obstacle. And this is the second obstacle, correct? Yes. Yeah, and this is, this obstacle here what is this obstacle? What is the king of the south? What obstacle is this? In the USSR at that time. Okay, so it's the USSR. And what is the USSR? Organized atheism in opposition okay. to Rome. So it's atheism. So atheism. Okay, now... When it, he's going to um, come into the glorious land, the language that's used there, he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. So in this one, we're going to have the many, and we're going to have the sum. And the sum, and I say it's even of Edom, Moab, and Ammon, the chief of the children of Ammon, um, specifically. So the many and the some, the glorious land is the United States, right? So that's, that's what, so when many are overthrown and some uh, escape the hand, so many overthrown, And some escape. What is this referring to? It's the Sunday law in the United States, but what is this talking about? And Jeff used to pin the many that are overthrown directly on Seventh day Adventists, but those that escape would be from non Adventists. Um, well, yeah, I, I would think that, that that could be true. But when it comes to the many and the sum, this is the majority and the minority, and this is in the United States. So yeah, many, I mean, Adventists will be overthrown. We know that. Uh, it's not just in the United States that many are overthrown, but the majority are overthrown in every group. But some escape of Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So this would be the Protestants. So this is the Protestants in the United States. So I wouldn't make this as Seventh-day Adventist and Protestants. That, that wouldn't really make sense. So this is about the Protestants in the United States in the glorious land. This is the second obstacle. 
And this occurs when? At the Sunday law. Sunday law. Right, so we have this Sunday law in the glorious land. That's the second obstacle. Now, verse 42. And verse 43, what are they going to address? So I'll do it this way. The countries in Egypt. Okay. And so gold and silver. Okay. So this is the universal Sunday law. And this is the UN. Would we agree with that? Yes. And so the king of the north is victorious over Egypt. Now, is third oh, obstacle. Yeah, now when we look at it here, the king of the south, who's the king of the south uh, prophetically, like historically? We want to say Egypt. Okay, so we would say Egypt, and then the glorious land, and then why Egypt again? Because if 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 the papacy, the king of the north, conquered Egypt in 1989, why does he conquer conquer Egypt here at the Universal Sunday Law if he already conquered them? It's the same entity, just on a larger scale. Okay. Yeah, so I understand that this is globalism, right? So this is the USSR, and this is the world. But this is now the UN. So, but if, if you just go back to the book of Daniel, and you look at it, if he conquers the king of the south, and then he enters into the glorious land, why does it now go back to Egypt? I don't want to say he's going from spiritual or symbolic to literal. No, he's not. But, yeah. Now, it's also the countries, right? Right. So we know that the passage says, and he shall stretch for his, forth his hand also upon the countries. Now, countries there is just the Hebrew word eretz, which means land. So to try to say that it's the countries, um, in that context, I'm not sure if that's that's really a good translation, uh, because I would just translate it as land. Um, but then it says, but the land of Egypt shall not escape. What does it say? Um, let me see. Yeah, the land of Egypt shall not escape. So we have over here, some escape from Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So what does Egypt represent here? I mean, we already kind of know it, but in contrast to this, does not escape. It's an overlapping of both literal and spiritual ideas. Yeah, I don't know if I would say that. I don't know he if does I would conquer say. the entire world. But yeah. He conquers it spiritually as well as physically. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, this is so I'm going to get rid of countries here. I'm just going to put land or the world. Right. So this is a conquering of the world. So, but in the book of Daniel, when he's going through this, he has a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, the king of the north. And the king of the south, they have battles at other times, right, in, in the chapter 11. And now they're going to have this battle here. The king of the south is going to push at him, and then the king of the north will come back at the king of the south as a whirlwind. Now, even though we're applying this at the end of the world, just from Daniel's perspective, just from a literal geographical perspective. I'm not saying it was fulfilled then. I'm just saying for when you look at this literally of what's being talked about, you have the king of the north. The king of the north is going to come 
and he's going to conquer the king of the south. And then he's going to conquer the glorious land. And then he's going to conquer the king of the south again. Does that make sense? Uh, historic, like geographically. Not really. We need to understand the symbols. Right. So, so to me, it doesn't make sense. If you were to take this literally, it wouldn't make sense. You're not going to conquer Egypt, then conquer the glorious land, and then conquer Egypt again. So, so I'm saying that it, it can't be applied literally. It must be understood spiritually. And so we know that the USSR fell in 1989. But we came to understand that the head did not fall. And, and we're going to look at this tomorrow. What we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to look at the parallel between uh, Millerite history and their understanding of Daniel 11 and our understanding of Daniel 11 and see where we made the mistake. Because we, we basically made, to some degree, the same mistake as the Millerites made. Um, and I'm not really sure how to illustrate it. I'm, I'm thinking about it. So anyway, we have here 1989, Atheism Falls, and we came to understand uh, later that, that even though the Soviet Union fell, the head still survived. Now the head, we took to be Russia. But we're taking the position here in this study, at least, um, at least temporarily, at least just to look at it, that the head is actually atheism, not Russia itself as a nation. And why would we say that? Why would we take that position? What mistake would we be making if, uh, if we took Russia as the head? What mistake? That would be a, What's that? that? That would be a literal interpretation then if we're taking a literal place. Right. We would now be, we would be making the same mistake as Lich and Uriah Smith. Because Uriah Smith made the argument that since the land of Turkey or Syria was the north, Syria was the north, and Turkey had possession of Syria, then Turkey must be the king of the north. They weren't applying that symbol, Sodom and Egypt, uh, symbolically as applying to a power that was atheistic and licentious, right? So they weren't understanding uh, that symbol. So when they, when they were addressing the king of the north, it must be the person that occupies the territory of the king of the north. But we also saw that France it became the king of, or, or the, uh, the king of the south. How did France become the king of the south? Symbolically, with um, through atheism. Yeah, it had to do with the attributes of France. It is an atheistic power, and it's licentious. Sodom and Egypt. So then the Soviet Union became the king of the south because of its atheism. And it was the target of atheism by the United States and the papacy. The battle over the world directly involved the USSR. But in our time, the battle over the world doesn't isn't about Russia, even though Russia's in the news and so forth. The issue is atheism. So now Jeff is looking on this big line because that's, that's how he's applying these things. So we know that this universal Sunday law is still future. This battle of the king of the north and the king of the south we're going to address in a lot more detail. But we have applied it in this history 
between 1989 and the Sunday law. And even, even more specifically, between 9-11 and the Sunday law. <coughs> so now in verse 44, uh, what is this event? Because remember, it's about the tidings out of the, the north and the east. And they shall trouble. They're going to trouble the papacy. He shall going to come with, forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. What is this event? What is the tidings out of the north and the east? He used to say the second coming on both cases, but we modified that to include the slow. Okay, so we'll call it the loud cry leading up to the close of probation. How's that? So you get these tidings out of the north and the east. And the north has to do with judgment and the East has to do with Christ coming. Now, how do we understand this North and East in this message? Rome and Islam. Um, okay, so Rome and Islam. Judgment. Yeah, so this is uh, judgments against Rome Right? So this is a message about the papacy. And then this is a message about Islam. Or the kings of the east. Which we could even, uh, you know, we could equate to Cyrus as well. So this is the east coming to deliver us from Rome or Babylon. Now, when we get to verse 45. Well, I think the north still implies uh, Jesus coming to deliver us to the second coming. Also. Right. But I'm saying it's judgments against them. Yes. From the north. Right. So, so these are both about Christ. So this is the judge. Christ is the judge. And this is about the coming of Christ. So I could, I guess I could do judging and coming. And this is Christ. But he's typified by the armies of Babylon. He's also typified, or not the armies of Babylon, a judgment against Babylon. And he's typified by the armies of Medo-Persia coming and delivering uh, God's people from Babylonian captivity. So he's the king of the north, the true king of the north, coming to take his kingdom that has been usurped. And he's also Cyrus coming to deliver. So it's, it's kind of the same symbol. The north and the east really are the same symbol in that context. So verse 45, uh, we're going to call this Armageddon. Armageddon. I don't know how to spell Armageddon. I think it has two Gs. No, one G. I'm not sure how to spell Armageddon. But anyway, this is, is the coming of Armageddon and the close of probation. So this is the events, the final events at the close of probation. And so this is going to be the papacy interposed between the seas and uh, the glorious holy mountain, right? And the seas are people, and the glorious holy mountain is God's church. Now, we know also that Daniel 12, verse 1, 
is the close of probation, right? So these are tied together. The close of probation happens at the time you have this, this battle going on. Could we call it a competition between the King of the North and the Glorious Holy Mountain for the attention of the seas? We both have messages that we're trying to get to the world. Okay. Battles or competitions. Anyway. Yeah, there's there's definitely a competition. It's the great controversy that's going on here, and it's it's some of the final scenes of the great controversy. I mean, we know there's going to be more here during this time of trouble, time of Jacob's trouble, and so forth. So, but this is sort of that climax in that battle over the over people where everyone has made their choice. So during this preaching of the loud cry of the third angel, you're going to have this uh, culminate in this close of probation. Now, you know, part of the problem that we have is where are we in this line? Still before the Sunday law. Yeah, so we know we're here. Somewhere. Now, we know we're after 9-11, but as far as in 1996, Jeff definitely is here. He sees the Sunday law, and he sees all of these events. The final events will be rapid ones. So in his mind, all of these events are going to happen probably before the year 2000. You know, maybe, maybe exist past that a bit, maybe even before the year 2000, maybe... We don't even get to the year 2000. So he's just seen these events. These are the end time events that he's looking at. Now, when we get into our history, we're looking at all kinds of events that are happening here, right? This is where we are still. We're still in this period of time. We haven't moved into this part of this line yet. And yet when we're looking at at these events here leading up to the Sunday law, uh, we become you know, very nearsighted or myopic, right? We, we start to look at these events in, in a way that Jesus is coming very soon and there's nothing wrong with that. We know that he's coming soon, but yet there's all these events that have to happen and yet we're seeing more detail here. Our focus is not usually on this big line because we've talked about closes of probation here within this movement. And yet the close of probation is over here. It's not until Daniel 12, one, that we hear, let him that's righteous be righteous still, let him that's filthy be filthy still. We don't hear that then. And yet we were placing these events here. Now, why were we doing that? Just emphasized process. Okay, emphasize process, yeah. So there's a progression of events. But, but that doesn't really answer my question. Why were we so focused upon looking for a close of probation here within this movement? I personally was surprised by the idea that we were looking for a close of probation within our own movement. Yeah. I didn't think that was really appropriate. Yeah, I, I wasn't necessarily surprised by it, but I didn't agree with it. So I took the position back in 2018 at the camp meeting that, um, that the close of probation we were looking for uh, with November 9th was just a close of probation for the false priest. That was, it was a rejection of light, that it wasn't Daniel 12, one. And I don't think that was received very well, uh, but that was the position I continued to take. Tabo kept fighting against me um, in, even in 2019 uh, for the first few months in a series of emails where he was arguing that it was the close of probation for, for everyone, and that it couldn't just be the close of probation for the false priests. Um, 
So, so there was this opposition to this idea. But what I think is we, we just became so focused upon what was happening in our history that we, we, were, we were confusing these lines. Now, part of it had to do with how we were overlapping the lines, the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanim. But I don't think that was the only problem. I think one is it was an interpretation of prophecy that that wasn't clear. Now, uh, I just need to see how much time we have. Let's hang on. Okay, so we got about 15 minutes. So what we're going to focus on tomorrow is we're going to focus on this part here. But just to kind of give an introduction to that. We have talked about it. And when we go through Daniel chapter 11, what is, what is it that we, what is it that we were looking at with the King of the North and the King of the South? What were we understanding about what happened in 1989? So let's just go back over that point. So 1989, the Soviet Union fell. So in 2017, what are we saying about what happened in 1989? We'd pretty well lost track of what atheism was doing. Okay, we lost track. So, but, but the point is, what was the light that came regarding Rafi and Paneum? What was that light telling us? So we're going back over the book of Daniel. We're seeing that we can take... Um, the history of the United States, and we can um, we can look at these kings, right? We can look at uh, Bush the first, uh, Reagan, I guess first. You got Reagan. Maybe I'll put it here. Uh, you got Reagan and Bush the first, and then what are we doing here? We're putting all the kings of the United States, we're lining them up with the kings of Persia. And what is it that's the Sunday law in, in the history of the kings of Persia? The fourth rich one, right? Yeah, so we're gonna get to Xerxes here, right? And Xerxes is going to be Trump. And Trump is gonna give the Sunday law in the United States. Didn't we also put Panium right on the Sunday law? At times. Yeah, we, we did at times. Uh, but normally we would put Panium as the midnight cry. And, and we're going we're gonna to go through this history. We're going to go through Daniel 11, how we came to understand it. So we would have midnight in the midnight cry here. This would be Raphi and Panium. And after Panium, we would then have the Sunday law in the United States. Now you can see here, we're taking all of this history that we're, we were going through from 1989 to the Sunday law, and we're ending with Trump. Now Trump is out of the way because what happened to Xerxes? Temporarily anyway. Yeah, temporarily, at least. Trump may personally be gone. We don't know. Um, I, I think that Trump personally is gone. I don't think we're going to see Trump again, but it doesn't mean we're not going to see Republicanism again. But what happened to Xerxes historically? Defeated. Okay, he is defeated by who? Greece. And so who's Greece? The UN. Okay. So the United Nations is going to defeat Xerxes, right? He's going to defeat Trump. Now, now we say the United Nations. Now, what if we just said globalists? That works. And okay. they defeat they defeat republicanism. Okay, so that's a battle between who? Who is 
you know, because part of this is we have a civil war. So we're going to have to address the civil war as well. So we know that this history here in 1863 is connected to our history, correct? Yes. So in 1861 to 1865, you have a civil war in the U.S. And that civil war in the U.S. is between the North and the South. And, and we're going to look at that civil war um, a little bit, not, not in detail. But we looked at Ellen White's civil war visions. And in that civil war vision, her first vision is about a civil war that's going to be coming. What's her second civil war vision? Does anybody know? What is it about? The first battle of Bull Run or the battle of Manassas? The same thing, but Angela put a note on the chat. Okay, what does it say? Somebody tell me what the note says. Xerxes was slain by Artabanus, according to A.T. Jones. I'd like to know who or what were this he represents, Artabanus, I guess. Okay. Yeah, we, we'll have to look at that. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that right now. Yeah, so Artabanus is um, the one who came after Xerxes for a short time. Most, most uh, historians don't actually recognize Artabanus. But anyway, uh, so we have this civil war between the North and the South. So if we're going to, to look at this, when we have the North, Ellen White has her second vision, Civil War vision, and she sees the South is victorious over the North. That's the Battle of Manassas. So the Battle of Manassas is a victory. The South defeats the North. Now we know that the North ultimately wins against the South, but the first vision that she has regarding the battle, so she has a vision earlier, but the first, the second vision she has is about the Battle of Manassas. And that's when the South defeats the North. And has the South, now who's the South in, in American history? So South defeats the North, South's victorious. It was separated by the Mason-Dixon line. If I did this, Democrats and Republicans, would I be wrong? No, it looks good. Right, because the North is Republican. The South is Democrat. Has that happened in our history now? Can we say that we have seen the Battle of Manassas unfold in our history in a civil war in the United States? Yeah, I think you can say that. Okay, where would we place it? Where did the... Where did the Democrats defeat, defeat the Republicans? Remember, this is not connected to this. Well, I'm still thinking before the Sunday law. Okay, yeah. So what if we said January 6th, 2021? Could we say that that was a parallel to the Battle of Manassas? In our time. Not literally, right? It's not an actual battle in that sense, even though it is the storming of the Capitol building. It's not, it's not very violent other than a few little clashes here and there. So it's something to think about um, to try to understand this history. So if we have the King of the South is the Democrats and they de defeat the Republicans, what would happen next? We, the formula says the king of the north comes down and completely wipes out the king of the south. Right. 
And then after that, we would have the Sunday law and the power that would bring about the Sunday law would be this, this power that has conquered the King of the South. Now, this is, you know, we've, this is just conjecture. We're just looking at this, trying to understand it. And we're going to look at it again tomorrow. But the big problem that I've always had as a Seventh-day Adventist is how do you address a Sunday law in a secular society? I mean, I can understand that maybe you could have argued in the United States, you have um, this, you know, moral majority, you know, you have a conservative, Republican uh, majority of some sort that would then bring about a Sunday law. But the question is, how do you enact this over the entire world? So there has to be something that happens. My default setting is always the fear factor. Something's yeah. got to create a lot of fear globally. Yeah, but it, but it can't just be a secular Sunday law completely. There has to be a religious element. Something has to happen that's going to change the hearts and minds of people around the world to support such a Sunday law, right? My, my take on the fear is that God or people become convinced that God is mad at the world, first not protecting the United States and then bringing judgments on the whole world. The, the yeah. fear is of God more than anything else, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. But there are, there are things that have to happen, right, for that to occur. I mean, you couldn't just have the world going on the way it is and oh, people yes. be fearful. So now, disasters, the strife among mankind, all these right. things, all yeah. high details though. Yeah, so we would look at disasters. We're going to have disasters, sea, land, air, uh, all kinds of disasters that are going to occur. But I think there's still something more that's missing. Um, because you can have fear in people. But that, but why should they think the Sunday law is the solution? I think that there's something more at play here that, uh, that we don't quite see yet. Uh, because it has to do with this atheism. And when we talk about atheism, you know, not very many people are actually what you would call atheists. Angela made a note. Okay. Um, the, the king of the south defeating the king of the north. Um, okay, you're going to have to explain because we have the king of the south defeating the king of the north. Yeah, that's uh, inauguration day, January 20th, right? Yeah, but, uh, oh, I see what she's saying. She's saying that did, did January 20th. Yeah, but we have that same symbolism with January 6th, too. Oh, I was thinking of the 120, the yeah, 120. But, like if you look at the day backwards and yeah. forwards, it's the same. Thought it signified something. Yeah, well, we're not saying that January 20th isn't important, but I would think that if you're going to look at the battle, uh, it was won already on January 6th. January 20th is just a formality. Nothing's, nothing's happening that day. You know, that, that's all I would say about that. But you have the symbolism of um, the 126 and so forth in, uh, in that date. But yeah, January 20th is important. So, so there's, these are things to think about. I, you know, I don't think we're going to resolve all these issues uh, like tomorrow or anything. But what we're looking at when we're looking at this foundation of this message we can see one of the problems that we have is we know the foundation was laid correctly, but Jeff was laying down a foundation that was looking at the big line. The problems came about as we tried to address what was happening uh, between 1989 and the Sunday law. Yes, and, we even got into what the prediction before midnight, sundown, all kinds of yeah. strange way. Mark. Yeah, now these are correct though. So, but the problem is where we were, how we were connecting them to the bigger line. 
That is, we didn't fully understand the role of this movement, because my position is that this movement is Samuel Snow, and particularly everything that we have experienced is really Samuel Snow's letters. Not, we haven't, we haven't come to midnight in the midnight cry yet. So this movement had a preparation. It's about, the, it's about what Samuel Snow was coming to understand. It's about an increase of light. And the prediction before midnight is about this movement's message prior to midnight. But even then, we have to recognize that midnight and the midnight cry are not way marks on the big line. That is, we were putting them in there as, and we'll see this tomorrow, hopefully, we were putting them in there as if they were way marks on the big line, but they're not. They're internal way marks within this movement. And so to put them on the big line, because Jeff doesn't have them on the line here, right? He has the loud cry. Now the loud cry would parallel the midnight cry in Millerite history. And yet we, and, and we're going to see this as we go through, you know, the, the following months, Lord willing, as we look at our foundation, we're going to see how we develop this understanding and why we got focused on things the way we did. We basically made the same mistakes as the Millerites because the Millerites didn't realize that they were having an increase of light that was a type. And that when they got to October 22nd, 1844 and they experienced that disappointment, they didn't know where they were in history. They were looking for the second coming and yet they were being led of God to establish that date, to begin the judgment, to begin the day of atonement. But they were looking just for the Day of Atonement to be a day, not to be a long period of time of over 100 years, nearly 200 years. So, um, so this is something that we're going to have to uh, continue to study on our own, um, something we have to pray about, uh, because we, we can see that there are some things we have to correct, but these are not major it's not like we were, were, were wrong. We were just not understanding the application of those lines. So those dates, everything that God gave us in this movement is correct. Except our understanding of those things. That's the thing that has to change. So um, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for... Um, the time that we had to study this morning. We're thankful for the way that you work in our lives, for the way that you have led this movement. And we pray for the people, Lord, who have um, followed this movement. Many have fallen away, but we know, Lord, that there are many who may not have fully understood uh, the issues. They may have had some connection with this movement. We pray that you can bring those back uh, to study these things. But most of all, Lord, we pray um, for those that are struggling now uh, to understand these things, help us in our day-to-day -day lives uh, to study. And we pray also, Lord, for your church, um, for the people that are searching for truth. We ask, Lord, that this message can go to them. And uh, we know, Lord, there's much, much for us to do. Give us strength and help us in doing these tasks each day uh, to accomplish your work upon this earth. Be with us throughout this day. Bring us together again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.